Welcome on this fourth Sunday in Lent. Uh, we had a power outage in this area, so our early service was not recorded, um, but we are doing a makeshift recording of this service so that those folks online will have uh, a, a form of the service to be able to participate in during this week. So thank you all for being here this morning. And our opening hymn is number 149, the hymnal in your pews, Eternal Lord of Love, Behold Your Church. I invite you to stand. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Jesus said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The first reading is from the book of Joshua, the fifth chapter. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the morning on the fourteenth day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. The word of the Lord. To God. Psalm 32 will be read responsively. I invite you to read the verses in bold. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt and in whose spirit there is no guile. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding, who must be fitted with bit and brittle, or else they will not stand near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy all who are true of heart. The second reading is from the second book of Corinthians, the fifth chapter. From now on, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, Everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. You may be seated for the Gospel reading. Lily and Jasmine Dayal are going to help me in telling the story for you this day. All the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property and desolate living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your own, treat me like one of your own hired hands. So he went off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord.
I need a sermon. I normally preach from over there, so hold on while I get my sermon. We are adjusting to, we're not accustomed to live streaming this service. So, today's gospel reading is well known. It's often referred to as the prodigal son. Prodigal meaning to be recklessly lavish and wasteful in spending money or resources. And boy, did that younger son excel at that. But I think a better name for this story is the lost son. In fact, this is the last story in a string of three lost and found parables that Jesus told. The first was a story about a lost sheep and a shepherd who left the other 99 sheep to find that one lost sheep. And when he found it, Jesus tells us, the shepherd said, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Then, importantly, he added, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The second story is of a woman who had 10 coins but lost one. She turned her home upside down for that one lost coin. And when she found it, she exclaimed, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. And then again, importantly, Jesus said, she added, just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then came today's story of the two sons, one of whom demanded his inheritance from his father, blew it all, and finally came crawling back to his father, who in turn threw him a great big party because the son who was lost was found. Certainly we can all relate to the relief and joy of finding something we thought was lost. Like finding your keys after hunting everywhere for them. Or finding those forgotten login credentials for an online account. Or how about that sick feeling in the pit of your stomach when you open your wallet and see that the slot where your credit card should be is empty. And then the relief you feel when you remember that you stuck that card in your jacket pocket after swiping it through the gas station pump. Finding that which is lost is certainly a relief and a joy. We can understand the desire to celebrate. But Jesus has a way of upping the ante. And he certainly did that with the story of the lost son. If we picture ourselves as the lost son, then the whole story makes sense and there is every reason to celebrate. This wayward son had returned home realizing that he had really messed up. His sole hope was that his father would take him on as a hired hand, for he knew he was no longer worthy to be called a son. But to his and our great surprise, the father did no such thing. Instead, he threw his arms around that son, kissed him, and set the wheels in motion for a lavish celebration. If we think of ourselves as the lost son, this is a very good story indeed. But there's another member of the family an elder son, a son who stayed with the father, worked hard, never gave him any trouble, surely was an upstanding member of the synagogue, a righteous, completely responsible son. And he was steaming mad. When he returned from being out in the field and heard the merriment and then found out why this big shindig was occurring, being happy that his brother had returned was the last thing on his mind, if it was even in his mind. 
This was the brother who had gone off, squandered his inheritance on a debauched life, and his father was rewarding him with a feast. He had never so much as had a goat for a party, let alone a fatted calf. And he had been there working the whole time, doing everything his father had asked of him. The elder son refused to join the party. This was so unfair, so beyond the pale that there wasn't even a word for it. Didn't the father even have a clue how egregiously unfair this was? It really was, you know. I used to teach eighth graders at Iolani School. And at the beginning of the quarter, I would ask the students to jot down their questions about religion. Any questions, none were off the table. Invariably, there would be one or two questioning God's fairness. Eighth graders are fastidious about fairness. If they detect anything that seems the least bit unfair, they will let you know. So the answer to a question like, can someone be bad all their life and then have a change of heart at the end of their life and still go to heaven has to be no. Because how fair would it be if someone who lived it up or down as the case may be and then had a change of heart received the same reward as someone who had led a decent, honest, law-abiding, church-attending, generous life. This was the dilemma with which the Pharisees and scribes were struggling. They were the audience to whom Jesus was speaking when he told these three lost and found stories. The Pharisees and scribes were the church people. And they had been grumbling to one another as they watched tax collectors and sinners gathering around Jesus to listen to what he was saying. Hmm. This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Who did he think he was, anyway? Snubbing them and welcoming the riffraff. They were the religious ones. They followed every jot and tittle of the law. These people certainly didn't. Any real rabbi would know that. Jesus knew what they were grumbling about, so he responded with these three lost and found stories. The first two stories were the setup for the lost son story. You can almost imagine the Pharisees and scribes thinking as Jesus tells these stories, the lost sheep? Okay, well, shepherds do get rather attached to their sheep. The lost coin? Well, good for the woman. She'd lost something of value and found it. The lost son? Whoa, hold on now. It would not have been the lost son with whom these Pharisees and scribes identified, but rather the elder son who stayed with the father, who was faithful to his duties, and obviously who was not appreciated given the fuss his crazy father was making over his debauched and impoverished younger brother. But in the parable, the father corrects the elder son. His mistake had been in thinking that the father's embrace and forgiveness of the younger son took away from the love and commitment he had to his young, elder son. This was not a zero-sum game. Son, he said, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This story is not about fairness, but about repentance and forgiveness, mercy and grace, death and new life. Jesus was making a point directly to those Pharisees and scribes through these parables. Do not begrudge those who are lost. 
Rather, look for them, invite them, love them, and celebrate when they are found. I don't know if the Pharisees and scribes to whom Jesus was speaking that day necessarily heard that as good news, but it certainly was. This is the amazing grace that we sing about. This parable of the lost son gets rid of the mistaken notion that we need to earn our way to God's favor. Try as we may, we will always fall short. God's delight is in repentance, with an eagerness to shower us with mercy and grace. As some of you know, when I was living on Kauai, I served as a hospice chaplain. As a parish priest, most of my time is spent with folks like you, who are already Christian, or visitors who are at least actively interested in Christianity, and therefore walk through the door seeking to learn more. In chaplaincy work, you encounter not only those who are regular worshipers at a church or other house of worship, but also those who intentionally left the church due to some grievance, those who never had any experience with organized religion at all, and those who just drifted out of the proverbial back door of the church and never returned. In hospice chaplaincy, they are all people who know they are dying and that their time is short. People who might not have been receptive to speaking with a chaplain before find themselves pondering spiritual questions. One such man was a patient in his 60s who, until he became ill, had been in excellent physical shape. His terminal illness and the lurking presence of inevitable death had stripped away all pretense, all bravado, all worldly illusions. His soul was troubled. And one day he began to tell me his story, or more accurately, he began to confess his story. He agonized over the downward spiral his life had taken. As an elementary school student, he learned about prejudice from those who, in his words, tagged him as poor and looked down on him. A quiet boy by nature, he kept to himself until the day when a student spit on him. Something which he explained was a deep humiliation and offense to him as a Hawaiian. He exploded. To his surprise, even though the boy was bigger than he, he whopped that kid and whopped him good. From then on, he decided that no one would ever mess with him again. He began to engage in more fights and became known as the school bully. As the years went on, his troubles increased. Drug dealing and murder landed him in prison. What he confessed about his adult life was serious. Now, with death staring him in the face, he wondered if God could forgive him, if it was possible for him to be welcomed into heaven. Today's parable is a resounding yes. Recall that even when Jesus himself was hanging on the cross, he had words of mercy for the criminal hanging beside him. This is what grace is, and it is perhaps one of the hardest parts of our faith to accept. God's grace toward others, because feelings of resentment and jealousy get in the way as they did for those judgmental Pharisees and scribes who thought Jesus should not be mixing with those tax collectors and sinners, and God's grace towards us. Often, even if we say we don't believe it, many of us act as if we have to earn our way to God. 
It's like those attendance charts we used to have in Sunday school where you got a star for every Sunday when you were in attendance. If I've got all my stars in a row, I'm good with God. If I don't, uh uh-oh. That's when people disappear from church. When things start going wrong in their families or at work or in other parts of their lives. Exactly at the time when we most need the church. Somehow the idea is internalized or picked up from others that if you're having troubles, you're not worthy in God's eyes or worse, that God doesn't love you. This parable tells us the exact opposite. God's love and compassion are far greater than any mistakes or problems with which we are struggling. And there is nothing that causes God to celebrate more than someone who repents and turns back to God. So that explains the younger son. But what about that elder son? He actually thought he had measured up. And comparing himself to his younger brother, he wanted that recognition. And some punishment for that younger brother would surely have been fine with him too. But there's a grace message for the elder son here as well. The father's love for him was never in doubt. He had always been there, and the son could always count on him. The father pleaded with his elder son to let go of resentment, let go of measuring his worth in comparison to others, to see and rejoice in the transformation that was happening before their very eyes. This son, his brother, who was dead and was now alive, was lost and was now found. Could he see and rejoice in that? Not being able to recognize the joy God feels when a lost soul is found is a stumbling block behind a lot of the pain in the world. When we run amok in jealousy and resentment, rather than celebrating the mercy and grace that God showers upon all of us, For the truth is, we are all that lost son or daughter, whether because of mistakes we've made or resentments we've harbored. And Jesus is saying to us today, you have a home with me. Let's celebrate. Can we see and rejoice in that? Amen.
I invite you to stand as you are able and to turn to the Nicene Creed printed in your bulletins on page 6. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And our, our prayers this morning come from the Book of Common Prayer, Form 1, and I will be adding uh, the grandfather of Chris Kennedy, who happens to be named David Kennedy. <laughs> this church has a former priest who was David Kennedy. It's not that David Kennedy. But uh, Chris's grandfather is quite ill. Um, he is uh, elderly and has pneumonia, and it's uncertain. And, um, how uh, long he will be with us. So let us keep him in our prayers today. Let us pray for the church and for the world. With all our heart and with all our mind, we pray to the Lord. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the church of the province of Myanmar. And in the Dawson cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Paul's Honolulu and the Reverend Canon Randy Albano and spouse Mimi and the Reverend Deacon Peter Wu and spouse Mimi. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our bishop and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, for the people of Ukraine and all who are in war-torn regions, for wisdom with those who have power over war or peace. For all your children, at risk and in fear, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this city, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, especially this morning we pray for David Kennedy, grandfather of Chris Kennedy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed, for prisoners, and for all who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed. This morning, we particularly pray for the repose of the souls of Carol Chi, Estelle Inn's cousin, for Millie and Myrna, members of Ruth Mertz's Ovarian Cancer Support Group, and for Madeline Albright, a faithful and active member of the Episcopal Church. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To thee, O Lord our God, we pray. Mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us share a touchless peace with one another.
You may be seated for the announcements. I want to first say a big mahalo to Lily and Jasmine Dayao, who assisted with the telling of the gospel story this morning. They were here for the early service as well, so it's been a long morning for them, so thank you very much. Um, we also, very interesting, did you know that we are in March Madness? For you who are basketball fans, you have to be a basketball fan to know about March Madness, I guess, but it uh, turns out I received texts from at least three people telling me that St. Peter's was in March Madness. Yes, and it's not us, but it is a small school in New Jersey, and they are like this, this uh, well, they're called the Peacocks. And Velma sent me some information that said the Peacock has a history of being kind of known like, kind of like the Phoenix. And this is like this school that has risen like a Phoenix. Um, un, unexpected. And they're now in the Elite Eight. I think they're playing right just about in, a, in a, well, you all have to stay for worship. But uh, <laughs> I think they're playing in about 15 minutes. So you may be able to still catch, uh, catch the game. Um, and yeah, we just hope that they continue to have a great run because it's a wonder, not only is it named St. Peter's, but it's just a wonderful story of, of a small kind of underdog team that is, is doing great things. So congratulations to the St. Peter's Peacocks. Uh, it, the Episcopal Relief Development uh, contribution jar for Tonga is on the greeters table. We're collecting all through Lent for uh, the recovery effort in Tonga following that uh, ma massive natural disaster that occurred there. And as well, if you would like to um, support the mission in Ukraine, you can make those donations online at Episcopal Relief and Development, or there's information there where you can send your contributions. Coffee hours are going to resume next week, for the, at least for the first Sunday of each month. Uh, as we have more people, more volunteers, we'll be able to add it more frequently. But just know that next week we will have our first coffee hour. It will also be the return of wine with the bread in Eucharist. So just a word, the way that it's going to work starting next week is I will be in the center with the bread. You'll be invited to come forward, keeping your six-foot distance, of course. And then you would... Uh, go off, we'll do one side, and the wine will be there if you wish to receive it. And then we'll do this side with the wine if you wish to receive it. It is your option. Uh, if you prefer to receive the bread in the pew, as I have been doing to date during this pandemic, just let me know, and I'm happy to do that as well. Uh, children's Christian Formation pop-up. Stephanie's been offering a uh, story time uh, for our preschool through third graders uh, in the bell tower. Take a look in there. She's got it decorated really nicely for the young people. So if you have children, grandchildren, have them come a little bit early and they can participate in that. It's going through Easter and then we will evaluate it for what will be ahead as another pop-up. Camp Mokalia and St. Andrew's Summer School information is in your bulletins. Take a look at that. Again, if you have children or grandchildren who might uh, enjoy those opportunities. The Lenten study that we are having uh, continues today at 1 o'clock. It is the third of five sessions with Father Phil and myself, and uh, you are welcome to participate in that. We are doing a study with Brother um, Bierhoff of the Society of St. John the Evangelist. So uh, everyone is welcome. You don't have to have been to prior ones. Just ask me for the Zoom link. It's by Zoom. And then uh, we continue to collect travel size hygiene products for the houseless ministry at Wally House. Uh, Bible study is every Wednesday at 10, again by Zoom. So just let me know. I'll give you the link. Jazz Vespers is on Thursday in person at 6 or live streamed. And a moment with music with Dr. Epping is every weekday by 6. Dr. Epping is on vacation this weekend over on the Big Island. And we are very happy to have with us Dan Del Negro. I hope you can see him. Dan is our jazz pianist in uh, the jazz ensemble on Thursdays. So thank you very much, Dan. 
Um, we have some birthdays today, indeed, this week and today. Terry Dang. Terry's birthday is today, and he is on a plane flying this away. He and Susan are returning from Las Vegas. And it is also Nick Wan's birthday. So uh, let us sing happy birthdays to them because we sang at the early service, but I told Terry we were going to sing for him, and there was no live stream for him to hear. So let us sing for Terry and for Nick. Happy birthday to you. And you too can have a sing for you when your birthday falls on a Sunday. <laughs> we have a number of other birthdays. Wyatt Jones has a birthday on Monday. Wyatt is Audrey Mee's grandson. Uh, Wednesday is Ellen Jean Foe's birthday, one of our nonagenarians, and Stephanie White's. Thursday is Beth Cox, and Beth and Barton are uh, left yesterday for Texas for a vacation, and also Ray Ono's birthday. And Saturday is Kelly Pangs, and I happen to share a birthday with Kelly. So let us remember um, all of them. And also, Valerie Beldovi asked that we remember her mother, um, Juanita Popo Yap, who some of you remember. Uh, her birthday uh, is Tuesday. She is deceased, but we will give a, a prayer of thanksgiving for her, her presence, both within the family and within the life of this congregation. So let us pray. The birthday prayer is found on page 7 of your bulletins. I'll insert the names so you don't have to remember all of those. And I'll add the special remembrance at the end. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants. Terry, Nick, Wyatt, Ellen Jean, Stephanie, Beth, Ray, Kelly, and Diane. As they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. And we give thanks in remembrance of Juanita Popoyap and all those who have gone before for the blessings they brought to those they loved and within the history of this community of faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we'll also include the travel prayer for Terry and Susan, who are literally traveling right now. Ken and Estelle, who are leaving for Kona on Friday, and then Harley and Sue, who are leaving for Kauai uh, tomorrow. Is anyone else here traveling? We have so many people all of a sudden traveling. I don't want to miss anyone. Okay, let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation and whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve those who travel, in particular Terry and Susan, Ken and Estelle, Harley and Sue, Surround them with your loving care. Protect them from every danger. And bring them in safety to their journey's end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We are uh, gradually adding things back in, but we haven't added the passing of the offering bowls yet. But they are at the doors. And as always, we thank you for your part in making this ministry possible. I invite you now to listen to a musical interlude as I wash my hands in preparation for Eucharist.
I invite you to stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you prepared for those who love you. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. and gracious God. In your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we'd fall into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and maker of all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he'd given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, Almighty God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Christ. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior, by Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God. 
I will come to you uh, to give you the bread. Just place your hand out. Uh, we are now optional with masks, so you are welcome to keep your masks on or to take them off. Uh, when I return, we will all partake uh, in the uh, bread together. You may be seated. the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. I invite you to stand or kneel as you are able and turn to page nine for the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of Christ and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now send us out to do the work you've given us to do, to love and serve you, as faithful witnesses of Christ our Savior. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our hymn is Lift High the Cross, number 473.
to love and serve the Lord. As we go on our way, we will sing, Jesus, Remember Me. <laughs>